Fantastic. You can hear me. Uh, wonderful start to this, to tonight's uh, conversation. I'm making this as conversational as I can. We want to continue this dialogue. And the, there's some places that I had some selections from uh, Manitos Comanchitos that I was going to read you. And, but instead, I'm going to quote the, uh, the Taos News article <laughs> that we had this morning. Um, Ivan Pesquera did a really fine job of, of putting it together. Um, unfortunately, they put Sylvia and me uh, in these really large photos, and they left out the photogenic, uh, <laughs> beautiful young people. That, <laughs> so, but it said uh, Enrique was, was uh, not available for comment. I was so far in the, in the Hemis um, um, watching. The fishing was pretty slow, but the ospreys were doing OK. <laughs> no cell phones, right? Um, so one of the, it struck me, one of the follow-up questions that a journalist would ask a scholar uh, Greg is very enthusiastic about his work. He's very engaging. And Yvonne finally asked him, well, why is your work on Henisaros and Henisaro identity important? And his answer was a one-liner. He said, because we exist. <laughs> so the subtext of my presentation and really all of my work is finding these things, finding these celebrations, finding these people that are all around us and have been all around us the whole time. We just didn't know how to look for things. In a fiesta, everything comes to, t to the plaza. Uh, everything uh, comes right in front of you, and you get important clues from a fiesta, but you have to keep going with the research. And the term henisaro, as, you'll, as Greg will tell you, was abolished in 1821 with, when the Mexican Republic emerged and they said, we don't want the caste system to continue. And so all of a sudden, uh, the word is gone from the documents. And there's some people that even think it's a caste term. It's not a caste term. It's actually a very, um, it's, it's, it's taken a course from the Turkish word and, and the Turkish troops, the very fiercest of the Turkish troops were Christian captive kids. And they took them away from mom, and they took them away from their aunties, and they put them in a, in a boot camp in, near Istanbul, and they became the fiercest uh, warriors and actually the, the protectors of the, of the sultans and stuff. And it was very um, unnerving for the Christian armies to, be, to face these, uh, uh, these children that had been taken from their communities. So it's actually um, almost kind of an honorific, and it's definitely not a caste term. So let's start close to home here. Uh, this was actually painted two doors down from here. Um, Blumenschein <clears throat> had been exposed to the fiestas in Taos. Uh, he was at all the, the, the fiestas in town as well, and he had heard all of these stories. I, uh, he wouldn't talk about this painting. The, the, the title is Extraordinary Affray. And people have, have, have puzzled over it for many, many years. Um, it seems to be a battle, but it's not a battle. Uh, Comanches preferred fighting at night. If they're really going to come in and do a battle, it would be at night. And you wouldn't, and the element of surprise was their, their most powerful weapon. So I don't know. Uh, could this be? Uh, a trade deal that went wrong at Taos Pueblo? Because uh, there seemed to be some, some elders uh, kind of watching. Is it some kind of contest? Uh, Ernest never said anything else. He said, just look at it, you guys. And I, I interpret it as a, a kind of romantic statement and perception of, of what's going on around here uh, in this center of Comanche political and cultural. and and commercial uh, interest. Because uh, above all, if you asked the Comanche back in the 18th century who they were, I mean, they were the best traders around. They, were, uh, they had the, the, the hottest economy, not only on the Southern Plains, but they, had li they were licensed to trade clear down to, to Mexico. We found documents of uh, buffalo tongues. They would pickle them and salt them 
and take them way down to Mexico and they could get 10, 20 silver pesos for a buffalo tongue down at the trade fairs there. Incredible. Um, so with all of the warfare, with everything happening, uh, the caste system just went to hell. You know, there's, there's no way to keep track of people. Uh, they, they make alliances with each other. They make families together, even though they're from different groups. And my favorite caste term is coyote. It's, our, it's probably our favorite one in New Mexico because it survived into modern times. Back in the day, uh, people, you find it in the documents, people would say coyote de Navajo, coyote de Apache, which meant you were half uh, Hispano-Mexicano and half uh, indigenous. And today it means uh, half Americano and half Hispano-Mexicano. So it, it's a great metaphor. Here we are speaking English. Um, if, if culture exists in your, in your mind and, and metaphorically in your heart, then uh, it, it's not about DNA. How could it be about DNA? All of us are, co are coyotes for our extensive use of the English language, you know? And, and some of us uh, are, are coyotes. Uh, my mom, uh, uh, her rebellion was, uh, she was from a rural area back east. Her rebellion was learning Spanish because she had read about these one-room school teachers out in New Mexico. And she just con confounded everybody uh, in her family. They said, well, that's what the Puerto Ricans speak over in New York City. Why would you, why would you <laughs> do this? And she said, I'm not going to New York. I'm going to Santa Fe. So the rest is, is history. And she was a very... A uh, curious woman. So yeah, I'm I'm coyote, right? I'm coyote. My other last name is is uh, Blanchard. Uh, you know, French American uh, Protestants. Um, anyway, my mom was very was very curious. She took my me and my brother to everything. She was a teacher. She had colleagues uh, in Isleta and Sandia, and so uh, she she'd take us along, and we'd see stuff like this. Obviously, not in the 1920s. But uh, we had no idea what was going on because no one talked about it, but it was just a, a terrific exercise in just watching and observing. Um, really great to have experienced at a young age like that. She took us to all kinds of other things too. She took us to the Quakers to, to see what they do, uh, the way they sit around the, the, in, in a circle and it, it's mostly silent their interaction and they're inspired to speak and we're going, wow, uh, they don't say a whole lot, do they, mom? And so she literally took us everywhere. She took us to the black churches in Albuquerque where they're just singing up a storm. She took us everywhere but a, but a, a morada. And uh, the, the hermanos and the morada found me. I found them later on. So here's what Here's what uh, changing computers does to the composition of your, <laughs> of your text. Anyway, uh, we, we picked this idea up in school, of course, and, and what, I'm, what I'm showing you is my own positionality. What is it like growing up in, uh, in central and northern New Mexico? This, we think this is our history, because our teachers said so, and we, we learned the, the war cry, Santiago y Sierra España. Um, this is... This is what you hear before you get lanced or before uh, uh, they shoot you or something. Plus Ultra is, of course, the, the motto, or the legend, the motto of Spain. And the two dollar signs, the vertical member is the, the two uh, rocks of Gibraltar. And, and the S's, what look like S's, are actually little banners where it says Plus and Ultra. And Spain is saying, our future is not in Europe. Our future is... is is above and beyond everything else, and we're just going to go get it. We're not just going to sit around Europe. Um, and so, what else did I see? Uh, in college, I had a, uh, an Irish girlfriend who grew up in, in Corrales and was the only Anglo student in, her, in the Lady of Sorrows uh, school in, in Bernalillo. And, and she says, No, I'm not Anglo, I'm Irish. Okay, so I, I learned a lot from her. And she said, Well, I, I'm taking you to the Matachines. I said, and so we, this is what we went and saw. Obviously, I didn't have a camera, but but I I, I was amazed. I was uh, just 
you know what it feels like to see the Matachines for the first time. It is, it is really an inspiration. Because uh, first you see it in an, in an Hispano village, then you can go see it in the Pueblo, and you say, why is this shared when so many other things divide people? Why does this unite people? And so then my attachment to Taos, you know, by, by the early 70s, I was coming to Taos. Uh, we'd be sitting uh, in the portal in front of Dr. Dominguez's office watching the parades, and, and here would come the Comanchitos. Here's, this is, uh, Greg the other day found a Russell Lee photograph of the Comanchitos in the, in, the, in the Taos parade, just like they were last, you know, a few uh, weeks ago. And I looked at them, I listened to the music, and, and I was amazed. I said, who are these guys? Who are these guys? Uh, my first, my first theory was maybe they're Boy Scouts. Maybe they're, maybe it's a local Order of the Arrow or some <laughs> imposters, some imposters or, or cross dressers or something. And 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 of course, Henisaros uh, and get accused of this stuff all all the time. You guys are phonies. You guys are imposters. You guys aren't. Uh, don't have any authentic, cultural authenticity or authority at all. We're just going to erase you. And they've, those uh, ethnic boundaries are, are, are really pretty heavily policed by everybody from ethnomusicologists and, and professors to, uh, uh, to Indian activists, you know, who, who uh, get really upset when, when they see indigenous groups without indigenous credentials, with no tribal IDs, right? So who are these people? And Anita Dominguez, my, my suegra, my mother-in-law, said, you know, uh, all of these little kids came through my class. And for show and tell, they all brought in their plumeros. Some of them brought in their little tombes, their little one-handed drums that you see them playing here. That's the Tewa word for drum, by the way. Um, some of them bring in a little chimal, the kid on the left is carrying a chimal and it's almost like a drum. That's the, that's the Nahuatl word for shield, as it turns out. And she said, there's something going on over in ranchos. Uh, there's families and these songs are getting taught for, uh, by elders to little kids. The little kids dance when they get old and stiff, then they sing and teach the songs. And this, this is a long, uh, firmly rooted uh, tradition. So I, I I'm a curious guy, and I hightailed it over there. Um, whoops, one of my pictures disappeared. But the other thing I saw in the early 70s were the Azteca groups coming through, and, and uh, I, remember, uh, the, I remember when they came in about 1972, it was part of the, the Chicano movement, right? Um, so uh, what are you gonna see? What are you, what are you gonna hear? And then all of a sudden, my tia Fermilia, my wife's aunt, worked at the at the archives in Santa Fe. And she said, oh, you've been in California studying Latin American poetry. Oh, what do you know? Why don't you read a poem from New Mexico? And she handed me a copy of the manuscript of, a, of an 1865 copy of Los Comanches. And I sat down and I said, wow, look at, look at these names. Uh, there seems to be battle scenes. There seems to be all kinds of stuff going on here. And uh, a friend of mine was, Don Cutter, the son of the famous history professor by the same name, and he was encouraging me. He said, you know, Enrique, these are historical figures that are in action, and this, it's a folk play. And then I checked in with my, with my suegro, with Dr. Dominguez, and he could recite a lot of the speeches. He'd get up and, you know, del oriente al poniente, del sur al norte frio. It's, it's an invocation to the four directions before a battle, right? Uh, Suenen brillantes clarines y brilla el acero mío. I went, wow, where did you learn that? The plaza in Chamisala, did, did they come out on horses? No, but half of them were Comanches and half of them were Spanish and we, we traded all these arengas. Arengas are harangues. Harangues are, is what a coach does to the football team, what the, what the uh, officer does to the men before battle, okay? So this starts building up and boy, when I, when the, the, the last time the college in Española disintegrated was about 18, 1985, about a third of the people lost their jobs there, including myself. 
And that's when I got my job at UNM. And, and boy, the whole family, the whole family walked to Chimayo that year. So we know all about Chimayo. And so here's a, we did a project of interviews and photog for photographers. So that was the stuff that I knew. And just the privilege of working at UNM and, and just say, saying, well, Enrique, this is stuff you love. You're, you're a literary folklorist. Uh, you, you're an expert on oral poetry and stuff like corridos and oral narrative and, and festival. Uh, you better do some more work here. There hasn't been much work done. And I, I, and I, I sort of realized that. So first I depended on my students. My students brought in all of these narratives that then became a soundtrack at the Hispanic Heritage Wing. I went, holy smokes, a lot of them took me home. You know, there's a great respect for educators in the community. And these connections that I, that I made were just extraordinary. And now, now I'm going to uh, mention the, the role of, of uh, philology in this. The philology means the love of words. It's also a discipline. It, it's kind of like before linguistics. Linguistics is more scientific. Philology is more uh, comparative. But it's, uh, what it, it means deep knowledge of a language. And I saw historians, I saw all kinds of people saying all kinds of things about Spanish texts that were just, that they were just making up in many, in many cases. The, the standards, the translation standards of the 1930s, they would add imagery, you know, they were, you were lucky if you got the basic meaning. They would, they would sort of beat around the basic meaning. And I said, well, let's just listen to it and see what's there and, you know, why why would people preserve texts like these for, for hundreds of years so carefully? They must mean something to them. Let's find out. And, and so I started listening to stuff in archives. And one day I came across uh, David Fresquez. I later met his family. His family's on the route for the Comanches on New Year's Day. Uh, Manuel Fresquez uh, uh, was the son. David Fresquez was an incredible and highly honored singer. He was an hermano. He knew all of the old alabados. He knew Navajo songs. He, he sang all the Comanche songs. And then what I realized later is that Comanche songs, that's like the stand-in term for, there, there's Comanche songs that sound familiar to Kiowas. There's Comanche songs that sound familiar to, to, uh, uh, to Pueblos, uh, to Navajos. And there's even a couple that sound familiar to Namana, you know, to the tribal Comanche people. So it is really, it is really a, a very mixed uh, tradition. So I want you to hear, look at, look at the uh, wonderful recording that John Robb made in 1950. Uh, he could barely speak Spanish, but he knew how to play some microphone and he had the best, he always had the best recorder available. We had a, con we had a, a concert, we had a little festival here a couple of years ago with people present that he had recorded in Taos. And so he gets someone to, to do a, trans, a translation and transcription and, and, and look at it. I, I looked in the book, uh, I listened to this thing, it attracted my attention, and I'm going, what? What is this? Uh, if things make it into books, you usually have to make it past an editor to get it in a book, and, uh, right? And uh, so um, it's, it's puzzling, and look at the translation, you know. Cinque la sana la hopa, you know, uh, we come cloth, we come secure, ah, uh, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, John Robb did a great record. Who, I don't even know who did the, the, the translation, but here's, here's what's being said. And there are Navajo words in here. Um, my first teaching job was on the res, and, and I know when someone is saying yes, it's, it's the, the O vowel with a glottal stop at the end. It's, it's O, and so there's, there's Navajo words in it, there's Spanish, and, and there's, a, there's what we call vocable singing, the kind of syllable singing that's, that's shared all across no, uh, North America between tribes. And uh, there will be a minimal, minimal uh, lexical stuff in most songs. There'll be a few words and then a lot of vocables. So let's see if we can uh, ring this up here. So you've got to hear this. It's very intuitive. Oh, <laughs> 
porque la muerte llega, porque la muerte llega, el firme no tiene dolor, el firme no tiene dolor. I couldn't believe my ears, neither could John Robb. We, we got permission from the family to, to use this in Hermanitos Comanchitos. And the people at the library were saying, we don't know who these people are. You're never going to find them. And I said, I know, I've, I've been to their house. I know, I know their grandkids. <laughs> I took Francisco, I took Greg's grandpa, and we had a ceremony of signing the papers and I gave them copies of all 20 songs that their, that their grandpa had recorded with Rob. And here's what he wrote. I'm inclined to think that the origin of the Indita, this is the general category, anything that has to do with the, with the native uh, uh, Hispanic interface, Inditas, the or, I, I'm inclined to think that the origin of the Indita is, is as natural as a mixture of Spanish and Indian blood by intermarriage. In one instance, I encountered what appeared to me to be the missing link itself. Um, it seemed to me to be an electrifying discovery. My friend and informant, David Frescas, who told me that he was a mixed Spanish and Indian ancestor, was singing for me in Taos. It was unmistakably an Indian type of melody, but sung to a mixture of Indian syllables and Spanish words. Okay, so he knew he had something special, but he had no idea what it was. It's a warning. It's a warning by somebody who knows Navajos, by someone who's uh, respected by his Navajo friends, and it, it's, it's a story from a long time ago. The message, don't take your sheep too far west. I know the grass looks really green over there, but if you were to take your sheep too far west, you might as well leave your sleeping bag home, and you might as well take your winding sheet, because they're going to... If, you're get, if you ever make it home, you'll be brought back in your mortaja, or they'll have to bury you out there. And so it, it's an admonition, a very powerful one. So one thing leads to another. All the clues uh, start falling into place. Um, it takes years and years to put these stories together. Uh, you realize that, that the conquistador thing is, is a fantasy heritage. And it's made up of real people who really believe it and, and get plenty out of it. But uh, uh, I was a member of the Cofradia of, of the Conquistadora. It, it only cost $3 a year. And uh, I was in the procession. And uh, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing um, twist on, on history, let's call it. Um, then the... The Aztec stuff, as it turns out, and this, these pictures aren't the best pictures, I was realizing that the Aztec stuff um, came from the 1920s when the government said, okay, we're going to honor, we're going to honor the classic civilizations of Mexico, and we know what the costumes looked like, but we don't have a great idea of what the songs were like or the choreography, so let's, let's commission some groups and see what we can come up with. That's how it started. And of course, the two groups emerged, the Concheros, uh, who had the, the instruments made out of uh, at, uh, like turtle and armadillo shells and stuff. And then the Aztecas were saying that's European influence and we're just going to go into this um, um, in the other way. Sorry, sorry to keep doing this. Um, another, another herencia in New Mexico, a very important one, is the, the, the Jewish the Jewish um, exile, the, 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 so, many, so many Jews came to New Mexico, it's, uh, the DNA is here. I know four women who've died from that BRCA um, problem uh, of uh, breast cancer and, and uterine cancer and stuff like that, and, and it's, uh, uh, the, the DNA is here. But uh, were the traditions, did the traditions survive all that time? Did they go through revivals? Uh, Yes, of, of, of course they did. And is it, is it these folks' religion? Sure, it's their religion. 
It's the Azteca's religion too. You gotta, you gotta respect people when you do your work. And then the further you get into it, you realize that there's layers. And these are the oldest layers. The, the Morismas and the Matachines are the oldest layers. The place where they were first done is Tlaxcala. And of course, uh, where are the Moros? There aren't many Moros around. When, when Europeans first came to Mexico, they thought Indios were, were Moros and they would speak Arabic to them and stuff. You know? They said, no, they're definitely not Moros. And so uh, the plays, the plays and, and the songs and, and the style of celebration just kind of shifted and into this new subject area that was right at hand, the Comanche stuff. And so you get further into it and, and, and you start learning about Pueblo culture as this uh, center space. Um, and of course we're northerners, but where did this idea of, of Norteño start? It didn't really start with, uh, with the, the, the Spanish Mexicans. Uh, maybe maybe in, the, in the 1530s a lot of them were actually Spanish and from Spain or something, but the, the big idea was to come north so, uh, Central Mexico is really too full of people. Let's go north and, and make our fortunes. And so north in this, in this uh, um, codex is to the right. And you'll see, um, you'll see a sagrario, you'll see the host, and uh, the, 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 all, the, all the stuff from, for communion, for the new religion. And they've, uh, they've made a cultural synthesis They've made an alliance, and they have, look at their little helpers. I put the squares around, and the size is not perspective. The size is, is relative importance. They have these little helpers. The little helpers are fully armed Spanish knights and cavalry. And, and look at them. They're, they're coming north to find Aztlán. And during the Chicano movement, we didn't even know this. We didn't know this. We thought that coming to Aztlán was like all of the guest workers coming across the border, right? A um, lot of Nahuatl-speaking people came up. Um, I'll run through it. Um, here's Coronado. Thousands, of, thousands of, of Indian volunteers just showed up. They didn't have to draft them. They weren't slaves. They knew that there was something in the north. They knew there were big ruins in the north. They knew that that's where they all came from. Let's see what's going on. Coronado had a bunch of uh, Purepecha-speaking people, Tar Tarascans, he had some Mexica, and uh, uh, Coronado was a, was a thug. They had abolished the, before 1540, they had abolished the whole concept of conquistador. So to use the word conquistador on anything that happens after 1540 is um, an anachronism, okay? And they made the new laws of the Indies that said you have to, you have, to have a priest, you just can't go doing mayhem the way that Cortez's guys were doing. And um, so that's Coronado. The, uh, Johnson did a great, a great series of paintings for, for uh, Richard and Shirley Flint's books. And some of the, the details are really accurate, except there were no trees. Every single, every single splinter of cottonwoods had been burned up. It was so cold back then. And Coronado destroyed every single Pueblo in the Tiwe Valley where Albuquerque is not because he wanted to destroy Pueblos, but he was after the Vigas for firewood. He occupied one Pueblo and he displaced all those people. Um, so here's what's going on. It was the Tlaxcaltecas that helped Cortez take down the Aztecs, who were kind of the, like the Nazis of central Mexico at that, at that time. A lot of people did not have much love for them. And the Tlaxcaltecas in Mexico, if you go to a grade school in Mexico, they're the evil traders, right? But if you go to Tlaxcala, this is how they think of themselves. We are the pioneers. We are the pioneers. We had a vision of ourselves in the future, and a lot of these other groups did not. And in 1591, they got relicensed, and the license is actually a beautiful document uh, ordered by the king through the viceroy. Uh, they become Hidalgos. You don't think of Indians as being Hidalgos. The Tlaxcaltecas were Hidalgos, okay? in per perpetuity, protection from their, uh, for their barrios and lands, protection of agricultural fields. Uh, they would always live on the other side of the river from the Spanish because uh, there were no fences. Uh, and if, if the Spanish animals came over, they had the right to, to, to kill them if they wanted to. They had protected fields. 
and they, they, had a free, they were free from servitude or income tax and all of that for three centuries, for three centuries from about 1521 to 1821. And they're the only uh, indigenous group who had the right to, to ride horses with saddles armed, okay? And uh, they have their own uh, self-government. Uh, in Tlaxcala, they believed that they were the founders of Santa Fe, among many other cities, including Monterey and Saltillo and, and, and a bunch of smaller towns. Um, here's what their plaza looked like. They were total equals. There's this, you can tell the Spanish side, you can tell the Tlaxcalan side pretty easily. So here we are, here we are. let's all go to New Mexico. The big question, question is, did, did they come? Well, some of them did. It, it wasn't as totally organized as uh, the, the foundation of Durango and a bunch of other cities that, are, that we have the documents for, but they, there were individuals that came to Santa Fe. Um, so here's the project. It's a kingdom. The kingdom needs legitimacy. It needs kind of royal legitimacy. It's not about Oñate, it's about his son. Because through in his veins, he flows the, the blood of Cortez, his grandfather, and Moctezuma, his great-grandfather, through his mom, uh, Doña Isabel Cortez Moctezuma. Uh, so here's how they do it down in El Paso. The mariachis play, and the flamenco dancers do it. and It's an amazing little celebration. Um, we love our American customs like American exceptionalism. And you guys thought you were first in Plymouth. No, 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 we were first. That's our American side, right? Uh, so here are the celebrations that started in, in Tlaxcala, the, the, uh, the morismas, the moros y cristiano stuff. Here's the big moment. Here's the big fantasy. It's the big crusader moment. It's when the Gran Sultan becomes a Christian. And the fantasy is that maybe Osman, maybe Suleiman, maybe Boabdil, maybe Osama, maybe Hussein, maybe they will become Christians after we show them our military might. So it's a fantasy that's many centuries old. Um, and of course, the Matachines is a, is a, a, a representation and dra dramatization of all of this in, in, uh, in dance form. Um, and I'll refer you to, uh, to my colleague, uh, Silvia Rodriguez's excellent book on, on the topic. Um, in Mexico, they call this La Danza de la Palma, and the other, the other kinds that they do down there, they have different names, like La Danza del, uh, del Arco, because uh, they, dress, they dress all differently, and they have these little bows and arrows that don't shoot the arrows, but it's a kind of percussion instrument, like in Las Cruces. So, so here's all these Mexican Indians, and they settle across the river in Santa Fe, we don't have the only uh, Analco. Uh, there's an Analco in Durango. It's called Analco. It's right across the river. That's what the name means. And so uh, within, after the Pueblo Revolt, within 80 years, it's a Genizaro town. It starts as a Mexicano town, and the Mexicanos become Genizaros, and all the other Genizaros coming in from all the other victims of the war, you know, the perpetual warfare that were going on. They came into Santa Fe, this was their church. Um, this, was, this was one of the important uh, virgenes. Uh, everybody knows about the Conquistadora. This virgen, this painting, is a painting of the Pueblo Revolt. A lot of people have never seen it. We own it now in the state of New Mexico, thanks to Charles Collier. Um, and this is, this is very rare, it's a, it's a statue, it's in the most important Franciscan church in Mexico City, and a little girl, the governor's daughter, had it. She was, it's a little statue like that. Duran, the next to the last governor, Diego Duran, his daughter got very sick, and she started hallucinating, and the Virgencita talked to her. She said, in four years, in four years, Santa Fe will be in ruins make sure to tell your dad. And so she told her dad and he said, yeah, I know we're in trouble, but what are we supposed to do about it? Well, one of the, when, when the Indians from Pecos uh, crossed the river, they picked up some of these macanas from uh, the Mexican Indians that, uh, in Analco, they had them like souvenirs, those obsidian edged, they, they kind of look like uh, cricket bats, but glass edged, 
and, and they, they hit her, they hit her in, in the forehead and she has a little wound and it bleeds whenever there's a battle going on because she's watching over these battles. It's an amazing tradition. And there's Guadalupe, who's like the, the, the whole process of mestizaje on a spiritual realm. Here's all the times she appears in Tepeyac. A lot of people don't know that she appeared in, in Zacatecas. The first day that, uh, that, the, that the Basque soldiers showed up, there was a big battle and she made a huge, she made a huge uh, tolvanera, like a huge uh, whirlwind. And at the top of the whirlwind, she was there and the battle stopped. And the Vascos looked at the rocks that the Indios had been throwing and it was the highest quality silver ore that they had ever seen. Bonanza, Bonanza, that's what paid for the settlement of New Mexico. And of course, here's the, the same idea of mestizaje on the spiritual realm. This is Chimayo, of course. And you keep learning and you keep learning. We're finally, I haven't been looking at my watch. I, uh, Sylvia will wave at me when I start running out of time. But uh, the, this business of cultural hybridity just keeps on going. Here we are in the 18th century with the Comanches who finally caught up with the rest of the lecture. And here's one of the most famous Comanche diplomats. This is the study that, that Catlin did of him. And he, he negotiated a treaty with the United States. His Comanche name is Jesus Sanchez. What's his Spanish name? Jesus Sanchez. Where's he from? Nuevo Mexico. Okay, here's the maps. It shows all the entradas. The Palo Flechado Pass was a way they could get in. Galisteo. Uh, not many came in through Chama, but the, 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 the Genisaros were placed in all of the most dangerous places. They said, Here, here's some land, all you have to do is fight for it. <laughs> and so here's the, the, the play. Uh, there's been a couple of years that they haven't put it on in uh, Alcalde, but uh, Cuerno Verde uh, refers, he respects the Genisaros, they're his enemy. He respects them, he said, that they're brave, brave fighters. And, but I'm, after making the, 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 ble the blessing to the four directions, we're going to fight anyway. And this is when he calls for, for music. Que suene el tambor y pito al baile, punto de guerra. So they dance before the battle. Uh, here's the campaign map when Anza went and got him. Here's more Cuerno Verdes, more battles. And I... And I finally found the picture, the oldest picture of a Comanche's performance over near Tierra Maria, 1930s, in uh, 19th century military uniforms. Okay, and then came the peace. Ansa was a great military leader. He was a tremendous diplomat. He's arguably the best governor we ever had. Modern New Mexico starts with what he did with Ecuaracapa. We don't know Ecuaracapa's name. He was a Cozoteca, he was from the plains of the buffalo hunting Comanches and the Treaty of Pecos held pretty much. Here's another one of these wonderful documents, so hybrid. They, the government put all, put all the Comanches on the, on the payroll. They said, we'll never defeat them, they're too strong. So put them on the payroll. Let's, this, this is the payroll for the first year. How many Comanches are fighting? how many Apaches they killed, how many they captured, how many mules and donkeys they got. And it's signed by uh, De Anza with a symbol. And so we've been celebrating ever since the peace. Here's the oldest picture of the Pueblo Comanche dance. Here's a newer one that I took. Um, except for the historical photos, uh, most of these photos were taken by my colleague Miguel Gander. Here's the earliest one of uh, Hispano Comanches from Taos. Greg and I were thinking this is probably over near where Sagebrush Inn is right now. Um, and here we are, Comanches de la Serna, New Year's Eve, two visitors, me and Miguel. And the same day, there's probably 500 Japanese tourists at the turtle dance, the beautiful <laughs> turtle dance at, at Taos Pueblo, but um, it's not done for a tourist and neither is a turtle dance, but, but people don't know about these things. Uh, so that's why the parade is so important. Here's all of the, the dances. Each one has a song. The, cap the captivity rituals are just heart-wrenching and amazing. And uh, here's a lullaby. 
El Comanche, la Comancha, se fueron pa Santa Fe, se fueron pa Santa Fe, pa vender a sus hijitos por azúcar y café, por azúcar y café. Watch out, I'm gonna sell you to the Comanches. Or I'm, no, I'm gonna sell you to the, these are the Comanches selling their kids for coffee, right? And, uh, this is, this is a year, I actually met Greg before this, but there's Greg. He's our next, uh, he's our next presenter. And um, there he is. How old are you? Six? Six? I got permission. I, I got permission. Here's, here's the shield dance. It's a recognizable shield dance song. It's called El Espantao. You scare somebody to death. And I defended my field work with this poem, which is in the songs. And in DC, at the, at the 92 festival, there, there were people saying, yeah, these guys are phonies. They're making this up. They saw a powwow and, and, and they made it up. They, who knows where they got this music? Maybe off the radio or something like that. And I, and I said, no, with this verse, I can prove that this, that, that, that this verse is from the 1780s. That's when the Hikarias came down to Santa Fe and they said, can you please help us? They're killing our families. They were the mo one of the most peaceful groups of uh, Apaches when they came to New Mexico. And uh, the Comanche and the, and the Apache made a date for war. Uh, the Apache cried and moaned, and the Comanche bared down on them even harder. Um, there's an eagle dance. That's Greg's dad, Esteban. And Miguel made a conversation with Edward Curtis with the same camera, same large format camera. Because Edward, look at the stuff that Edward Curtis passed up to go straight to Taos Pueblo to get the real Indians, right? Um, some of those, here's some poor captives. <laughs> They're not crying too hard. And you get to buy them. And then it's everywhere. There's, there's Comanches for Guadalupe down in Albuquerque. There's the Nativity play that's out in Western New Mexico and Central New Mexico for Christmas Eve. Here's another Christmas Eve thing that honors all of the little captive kids. Uh, Comanche and not, uh, little Mexicano kids that became Comanche and Comanche kids that became Mexicano. It, it honors all of them. And here's a couple little guys. Here's a Com on the right is a Comanche dancer from Okay, Winge, and, and then here's one of the Nanie dancers from Abiquiu. One has a tribal ID, the other one doesn't, okay? Any other difference? Some more captivity dances from Abiquiu. You'll hear about Abiquiu from, from Greg. Then clear down to Tomé, and these are the last two slides, thank goodness. Uh, our friend and Comanche, uh, Jerry Padilla, made these verses up. They make they use old ones and they make new ones. And he said, Cuerno Verde with his war could never accomplish, could never conquer what Ansa and Acuera did with peace, Comanches and Mexicanos dancing in friendship. So uh, Jerry, uh, you may remember Jerry's columns in the Taos News. Uh, he admired, we all admire, uh, we all admire Acuera He was, all we know is that he was a Cotzoteca. He was one of those buffalo people. And uh, he really deserves a bronze. He, he brought the piece just as much as uh, Deansa did. So that's my presentation.